Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on First and Second Peter entitled, Feed My Sheep, First and Second Peter. And this particular lesson is lesson number eight in that series for May 20th, 2017, entitled, Jesus in the Writings of Peter. I think we're going to find this very provocative and interesting and challenging to think about. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these words that you inspired your friend Peter to write through the work of the Holy Spirit and uh, all that that implies. We now ask him to guide us as we work our way through these materials that we may think clearly about your character, your government, and what you want us to learn is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to see, we're not even going to have time to come close to read all these passages. It refers back over and over and over again to some of these passages, but we're going to see that there's a lot of talk about Jesus, his sufferings, his life, his death, and even his ascension to heaven and his ministry in heaven in this lesson, or lesson, and of course, obviously, in First Peter. Um, that certainly suggests that Peter was focusing on Jesus as our salvation in this short book. For those of you who know about the writings of Martin Luther, this is one of the books he praised most of all. He thought First Peter is a book that really talks about the way to salvation. But so, what about Second Peter? <laughs> he wasn't very happy with Second Peter. Second Peter didn't belong in his, he didn't even include it in his New Testament. He put it at the end. He said, well, this is a kind of a New Testament apocrypha. So we'll get to that later. But First Peter was a shining light in Martin Luther's book. Implied by Peter's words are the ideas that Jesus is in fact, and here's what he implies in this lesson. One, Jesus is divine. Two, he's a being who came in human flesh. Three, he once he was one who lived and died to provide the means by which we can be saved. And four, the one who came to answer the most important questions in the great controversy over God's character and his government. The clearest evidence of the truth about God's character and government is revealed in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because he is God. Now, if I asked every one of you, I'm, I think you would all say, if you, if you wanted to go somewhere and you wanted to get the, the most direct and, and best understanding of God in the Bible, you would probably say in the Gospels because of the, because of the um, example of Jesus. Well, our lesson suggests that the prime theme, primary theme of the Bible is how God saves you and me. Well, Ellen White didn't seem to always think that. Um, look at these words. This is found in the Science of the Times, January, February 13, I'm sorry, 1893. Through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested. So that's one of the things she thought was important. Do we believe God is a good God? Uh, the charge of Satan refuted. That's another really big point. The nature and results of sin made plain. That's a really important. And the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. And she doesn't even mention how God saves you and me there. And she, it's quoted several other places um, in the references there. If you want to get our handouts, the ones we use here in our discussion, they're available on our website at Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you can get what we're looking at here. Another reference, this is from Desire of Ages, if I remember correctly. Atraction Prophets. Atraction Prophets, I'm sorry, 68 and 69. Um, but the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Not, not that it leaves that out. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God 
as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Now some of you are going to say, oh, she left out a word. The King James Version has all men unto me. Well, it turns out that men is not supposed to be there. It's not in the Greek. That's a, a supplied word that the translators put in. And the reason we leave it out is because of what she says next. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. Patriarchs and Prophets, again, 68 and 69. So clearly, to Ellen White's mind, this larger view, this universe-wide view, was something we, had to con we have to constantly keep in mind when we study the scriptures. Well, so now let's go back to what our lesson was talking about, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For, by, for you know what was paid to set you free. Okay, what was paid to set you free from the worthless manner of life handed down by your ancestors. It was not something that can be destroyed, such as silver or gold. It was a costly sacrifice of Christ, which, who was like a lamb without defect or flaw. So what is Peter suggesting here? The costly sacrifice of Christ does what? Pays the price for our salvation. Isn't that the implication? Yeah. Well, Colossians 1, 13 and 14 say, He rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us safe into the kingdom of His dear Son, by whom we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. So we are set free from the darkness. Okay, what does it mean to be set free from the darkness? Well, the process... The light. I, yeah. You know, if, if we turned off all the lights, we would be in darkness here. And to be set free from that, we would turn on the lights. Not too long ago, my wife and I traveled to Texas. And in the way coming back, we stopped at the... No, actually, on the way going there, we stopped at the Carlsbad Caverns that many of you know about. And you can go down hundreds of feet down into the earth. And when they're down there, they said, okay... And you're, you're on a guided tour, they say, we're going to let you know what it means to be really dark. So everybody make sure you either sit down or get yourself in a solid place where you're sure you're, you're safe. We're going to turn the lights out. And it was really dark. <laughs> it was really dark. There was not, I mean, you could not see anything. So I think about that. Well, the process of redemption or ransom is something the Bible speaks about in considerable detail. And there's, we just read 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Exodus 34, 19 and 20, Leviticus 25 and several verses. And there's other verses we could give. Jesus is spoken of as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Those were the words of John the Baptist at his first meeting <coughs> with Jesus in John 1, 29 and 30. But how does that actually work? We need to remember, uh, just instead of just taking it very simply like that, that Hebrews 10, 1 to 4 suggests that the sacrificial animals in the Old Testament were at best only a shadow or a faint outline of God's plan of salvation. In fact, a little bit later, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. Hold on, wait, back up. You mean all those sacrifices couldn't accomplish anything in the Old Testament? No. And she goes, he, he, I believe Paul was the writer of Hebrews, down in verse 11 he says, Every Jewish priest performs his services every day and offers the same sacrifices many times, but these sacrifices can never take away sins. So what are we talking about here? How can the sacrificial death of Jesus buy us back from sin, as our Bible study guide suggests? Is the blood of Jesus some kind of payment? 
Well, it's, I think it symbolizes his death. Okay. Uh, as well as his life. I, I, you know, the life is in the blood. There's that symbolism there. Mm -hmm. But when somebody sheds their blood, you think in terms of mm -hmm. death as well. So in Romans 6, Paul talks about the, the death, bur burial, and resurrection, how mm -hmm. we died with him mm -hmm. and we are raised together with him. So, uh, so we go through that same death, burial, and resurrection process in uh, all, all that was part of the old world and the sin and everything dies with the body that we Christ hope. died. And, and then on the other side, he's raised in newness of life. Mm -hmm. And so we are created, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared beho beforehand that we should walk in him, in them. So we are his offspring if we indeed... Um, okay, so now the question is, how does the payment of Christ's death impact all of that? It doesn't really, does it? It's, it shows the depth of his love. I mean, how far can you go before you tick God off and he forgets about you? Well, I, you can't because he showed that he went all the way to death. Mm -hmm. And he won't, I mean, you can't tick him off. Well, one thing I would like us to think about, did you come when come? Yeah, I was going to say, he went all the way to his death to show us the way mm -hmm. to that truth that will set us free. Yeah, okay. So we're, we're supposed to learn something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not just an act mm -hmm. of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It's an act that he went through to show us the way to that perfect love mm -hmm. that loves even one's enemies. Yeah. So... We must be born again. Many exactly. Christians, many Christians see the death of Christ it's something you don't need to really understand it. It's just by some magic out there, God paid for our sins, and I go, and in some cases I have to confess to a priest, uh, but others I can pray and I can ask for forgiveness, and I don't have a clue how it impacts me, but thank God he paid the price. Is that the way it should be? No. Well, if we look back, we discover in Genesis 2, verse 17, God says sin leads to death. And we read on a few more verses in Genesis, the beginning of Genesis 3, the first few verses. Satan right there says God is lying to you. So now one of the things that has to be resolved before salvation is possible, at least it seems like to me, is find out who's telling us the truth. Was Satan telling the truth or is God telling the truth? So how would we determine that? It is clear that sin leads to death. We have proof of that every day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if we recognize that Jesus did not die of blood loss or, or maybe just of the very fact of crucifixion, but instead he died as a result of sin, thus demonstrating the deadly effects of rebellion against God, then it would be clear to us why this sacrificial death of Christ can win us back to God. Is that possible? So that is the theme which is found in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. At least that's the theme I see. We need to dig deeper in God's holy word to understand these issues. And I'm reminded of the words from Bell and White in Great Controversy, page 593. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. So that sounds like we need to do some serious digging and some serious thinking, right? Well, what? What's the difference between digging and... Thinking? No, it seems like it's different to me, digging and dying. Okay. Uh, you were talking about dying first. Why does he have to die? And now you're talking about digging. I'm, I'm saying that we, if we suggested, we've suggested just superficially, and we're going to try to see if that's true, the reason for the death of Christ is so we can learn something. And I'm saying, okay, if there's a lesson to be learned, let's dig until we, until we learn that lesson. Well, I mean, study. I'm talking about studying the Bible. The, the, the death to me, I've run into a lot of people that, I've, that said that God will never forgive me for other things I've done. 
-hmm. They believe they've gone too far. Mm -hmm. and, and the cross, to me, shows that you can never go too far to be yeah. forgiven of God. Sure. And that's the big thing for me. I, I know that you probably learn something if you keep going, you know, as mm -hmm. far as sacrifice all the way down. But to me, it's just telling you that God is accepting clear to the end. Mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing you can do. The devil can't, I mean, don't listen to the devil. Mm -hmm. He's not, he's going to tell you you've gone too far. Yeah. But, well, let, let's see, let's look at this. What can we learn from the substitutionary sacrifice of animals in the times of the Old Testament? What did they do? A sinner would bring a lamb. He would confess his sins on the head of that lamb. He would cut the th throat of that lamb and out would pour the blood. And the priest would take that blood and he would sprinkle, he put some on the corners, the, the little horns of the altar. And then he would pour out most of the rest of it at the base of the altar. And in symbol, anyway, that, that the sins of the of the person were transferred to the temple. And then when the Day of Atonement came along, that the high priest would go into the most holy place, he would carry those sins back out, and he would place those sins on the head of that scapegoat. And what happened to the scapegoat? Taken far away and left to die. That scapegoat was taken far away. So for people who are used to very concrete, former slaves, who are used to very concrete kind of thinking, they watched that goat go and someone taking it by leading it out there. And they said, oh, okay, there go my sins. And, and, and it was an important lesson for them. Um, you transfer sins like that? No. Well, okay, now you're thinking in more theoretical well, terms. Well, we'll, we'll get to that in I, a moment. I, I think the slaves saw promise in the blood I mean, yeah. the, not that the blood saves, but when God promises, what else can he do but to, to, I mean, how else can you make a promise unless it's a blood promise? I mean, that's as far as you can go. That's the that's ultimate promise. That's the it? ultimate promise. And how in the world can God go any further than that except actually dying? Mm -hmm. Well, our, our Bible study guide for Sunday, May 14, says it in these words. What does the fact that our hope of salvation exists only in a substitute, punished in our place, teach us about our utter dependence upon God? So what is a substitute punishment? That's ridiculous. <laughs> Why is a substitute punishment necessary? I mean, is, is God demanding it? Let's, let's, let's think about this. Is God demanding it? No. Is God the Father demanding that a death be the payment for, by, for offending him by breaking his law? At the cross, was God pouring out his wrath on his son? Well, yes, in one sense. But we need to understand, that if, we, if we say that, that God's wrath means he gives up. He hands somebody over. He says, there's nothing more I can do. That's it. It's interesting to notice that every one of the Ten Commandments has a death penalty connect, attached to it except the tenth. The children of Israel rapidly came to the conclusion that almost any open sin should be punished by death. So why was the tenth, by the way, not uh, punishable by death? I was waiting for someone to ask it's that question. It's in your mind. You can't how, how can, see it. You can't see it. You can't check on some, whether something's being covetous. And there's a lot of verses that, that deal with that, and I, a whole bunch of them are listed here. And if you get our study guide, you'll find that uh, in our website, there's a place where you can go and it's all spelled out in detail under the handout for Leviticus. Of course, well, God can do that. Can do what? He can, he can check out the Tenth Commandment. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. In fact, when... He certainly does. When the resurrections happen, you've got separation happening at the resurrection. Yeah. You've got the resurrection of the the good for the thousand years and you got the the others that are going to be resurrected after the thousand years yeah. so there's got there's going to be some sort of separation hap happening yeah. there and you're going to have to trust him on that so now we're let's put together some more pieces here 
When someone speaks of the passion of Christ, what comes to your mind? His suffering. Look at look at First Peter two twenty one and twenty to twenty five. It was this that God called you. It was to this that God called you. For Christ Himself suffered for you and left you an example, so that you would follow in His steps. He committed no sin, and no one heard a lie come from His lips. When he was insulted, he did not answer back with an insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but placed his hopes in God, the righteous judge. Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. It is by his wounds that you have been healed. You were like sheep that had lost their way, but now you have been brought back to follow the shepherd and keeper of your souls. Okay, so how does that work? It's interesting that in, in access to go and read Isaiah 53, the, the full chapter there, I don't have time to read that, all of it. But it's very important to notice in Isaiah 53, verse 4, it says, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. When it says something like that, we thought, what does that mean? What does that imply? Likely to have a false concept. Yeah. Ellen White picks that up, and she has these very interesting words in Desire of Ages, page 157, the second paragraph. As Jesus came into the temple, now this is the time of the first Passover that, during his ministry, not, not his, when he was 12 years old or anything after that, but when he's actually after the baptism and so forth, his ministry. As Jesus came into the temple, he took in the whole scene. He saw the unfair transactions. He saw the distress of the poor who thought that without shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness for their sins. And what verse is that quoting? That's Hebrews 9.22, isn't it? Which a lot of people think is the key to salvation. Unfortunately, that is mistranslated. It should be remission yeah. of sin, which is not the same thing as forgiveness. Well, right now, and, and I agree with that, but right now we're talking that these poor people thought that without shedding of blood. He saw the outer court of his temple converted into a place of unholy traffic. The sacred enclosure had become one vast exchange. So she seems to suggest the same idea. You know, is this really, and we already read Hebrews chapter 10 that says the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. Well, I'd like to put Jeremiah 7.22 and Amos 5.25 oh, yeah. in there where it says, you didn't know, I didn't give you instructions regarding sacrifices and bird offerings. Mm -hmm. And uh, you didn't offer sacrifices in the wilderness. And then, uh, uh, well, Stephen, Stephen in, in his sermon, yeah. he says, Acts seven. same thing in Acts 7, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, this business of, of blood sacrifices is, is yeah. really distorted the truth about God. Well, many Christians believe that God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. What does that mean? Is, that is true. But we need to understand that God's wrath simply means his handing him over to the consequences of sin in this case. And that's clearly spelled out in Romans 1, 18, 24, 26, 28, and 4, 25. And then you really need to compare that with Matthew 40, uh, 27, 46. Suggesting that whereas we were the ones who committed sin and should have died, that's us, as a result of that sin, Jesus was handed over by the Father and allowed to die to show us what the second death is really like. Well, remember that Jesus himself said that he could lay down his life and he could take it up again, John 10, 18. So if God is not the one who killed Jesus, who or what did? Who, was the authority, who has the authority to say that something, someone must die because of sin? Well, here's what Ellen White says, and this, of course, is Desire of Ages, page 753, second paragraph. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. And then look at these incredible words. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. When is that? We're talking yes. at the second coming or maybe the third coming, right? It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. And what did he die of? 
broken heart. A broken heart. So he died of sin. So it says in those verses, and we're going to see some more references to it in a moment, that Jesus died the second death, the death of sinners. Was the second death a broken heart? Mm-hmm. Okay, so even the, the sinners that hate God are going to die of a broken heart? Yes. That doesn't make sense to me. Not well, it depends well, on if you think of a broken heart as being uh, a feeling compassionate. Uh, uh, you know, El, or else what? El, Ellen White describes it. Of, the stress of being removed from life. Yeah. Ellen White describes it like this. They're going to look into the holy city they're going to see Jesus raised up high above the holy city and on his throne, and they're going to realize how foolish their, their choices have been, and they're going to say, they're going to, she says literally they're going, to, they're going to shout out their sins to the whole world. They say, why, why did I do that? Well, then why wouldn't they be converted after that? Because if you gave them another chance, she goes on to say they would go back and do the same well, thing they did. they weren't converted. No, I, I didn't say they were converted. Okay. You're the one who said they were converted. Well, it sounded like you, you said no, that because they were they're, confessing they're, their sins. They're very sorry about what they, I mean, they realize, they realize the consequences of their sins, but they're not willing to make a, a, a different choice. They would still make the same choices. They don't like the consequences, but they, they're not willing to do anything about the cause. Well, that sounds more like stupidity. Well, it is. Well, I don't know. Welcome to Satan's camp. I don't know. It's all stupidity. I don't know if it's all reasonable like that, but there's a I'm, lot I'm of things I'm just quoting about the what, heart. yeah. We well, are I'm to, trying to understand what yeah. she's saying, too, because yeah. and To me, the broken clear. heart is something else. Yeah. He was looking at these people, killing him. Mm -hmm. He is bringing them the truth that can save them. Mm -hmm. They want nothing of it. Mm -hmm. Talk about a broken heart. You give them the truth that can set them free. Mm -hmm. They don't want it. Mm -hmm. And for 40 days after that, they still didn't understand what it was all about. Yeah. That's what he died of, yeah. broken heart. People won't listen mm -hmm. to the way to life. Yep. All of that would be included in my mind. Well, First Peter... 221 is what our lesson asks us to read. It says, It was to this that God called you. We read this already. For Christ himself suffered for you and left you an example so that you would follow in his steps. Does that mean that some of us might be asked to follow in his steps all the way to the point of persecution, torture, and even death? They hated me. They'll hate you. Peace. Many martyrs have died for their faith. Could one of them have been the sacrifice for our sins? No. No. Why not? Because it's not, because I don't think it's it's just about legal issues. I think there's an organic nature to this whole thing of sin. It's not that just that we did something bad and uh, God has to do something to to offer forgiveness. I mean, can't we offer forgiveness to one another when uh, when we're offended without yeah. having to go through some kind of big uh, uh, Legal payment of penalty and right, so forth. Right, right. So I think, I think there's there's more to it. We we changed when we fell. We were separated from God, and to okay. restore us to God is uh, a kind of our that vital connection that Ellen White mentions yeah. is is a process. It's not just about forgiveness and you, legal issues. Do you think the death of Jesus was different than uh, just an ordinary death that happens yes. in our day? It was what, the second death then. What was it that actually killed Jesus? Separation from God. Yeah. God's, and I read, and I quote again from Ellen White. This is uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 141, I believe it was, 124, I'm sorry. God's spirit will not always be grieved. It will be part if grieved a little longer. After all has been done that God could do to save men, if they show by their lives that they slight Jesus' offered mercy, Death will be their portion, and it will be dearly purchased. It will be a dreadful death, for they will have to feel the agony that Christ felt upon the cross to purchase for them the redemption which they have refused. And they will then realize what they have lost, eternal life and the immortal inheritance. Wow. 
But they will not change. <coughs> They're not going to change. Well, the Bible, and, and now it goes on, 1 Peter 1, <coughs> 3 and 4, 21, chapter 3, verse 21, John 11, 25, Philippians 3, 10 and 11, Romans, Revelation 20, verse 6, clearly teach that the resurrection of Jesus Christ proved that God has the power to raise us also <coughs> and to take us to heaven to live eternal lives with him. So one of the things that we're supposed to learn from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is that God has the power. I mean, we could learn that even from the story of Lazarus. God has the power to raise us out of that grave. That's, of course, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 21. If Jesus did not rise up from the tomb and return to heaven, then our faith is in vain and there's no recovery from our sins, according to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 17. It is interesting to note that Jesus waited four days to resurrect Lazarus in order to make sure that no one could question his death. Should Jesus have waited in the tomb four days so no one could question <coughs> his own death? Have you ever asked yourself that? You know, people have claimed, well, he, he didn't really die. The only reason he was able to, to rise. So shouldn't he have stayed in the tomb a little bit longer? Well, here's a question that Christians have struggled with. Is it primarily the death of Jesus that pays for our sins? Or are we somehow taken care of by his resurrection? Or do we need both? Well, n neither is a payment for sin. Okay. Yeah. It's a payment to show us the way to that truth that saves. And that's true of his death as much as it is true of his resurrection. Because he proves that if we live a life of love as he did, mm -hmm. there is no other outcome than the resurrection. Yeah. Romans 5.10, we are healed by his life. Mm -hmm. and that's re and for remission of sin, I mean, it's, it's got to go on to change your thinking about God. I like to think about the change that happened among the, in the disciples from Crucifixion Friday to Pentecostal Sunday. What happened? What an incredible transformation. Well, Desire of Ages 787 says these words, to the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. Life is hid with Christ in God, and when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory, John 8, 51, 52, Colossians 3, 4. <clears throat> At his sudden coming, all the precious dead shall hear his voice and shall come forth to glorious immortal life. So to us in this life, death seems so harsh, so final, so unforgiving. It is only through the hope we have in Christ that we can see beyond the tomb. And that's, I think that's what happened to the disciples. I mean, look at Peter here. A woman points her finger at him. Oh, no, I don't even know this Jesus. Oh, no, no, let me curse and swear. And then... Seven weeks later, or not too long after that, he's standing up in front of the Sanhedrin and he says, this Jesus whom you killed is the one who, bring, who brought this man back to life. And they must have said, shook their heads, what happened to this guy, you know? Well, look at Matthew 16, 16. We've looked at this many times, but look at it again. Simon Peter answered, and Jesus answered them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You think Peter had any idea what he was really saying when he said that? Well, it's a label. You know, uh, John had, uh, had pointed to him as the Lamb of God, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I think... Um, Andrew came to Peter and said, we have found the Messiah, I think. Right? Yeah. Or okay, the, the word by. So they, they knew the term and, yeah. and such, but whether they understood the import of all of that is another matter. They had a different idea of what the Messiah was supposed yeah. to do. The Greek word Christ means the anointed one. In Hebrew, the word is Messiah, a Mashiach. Um, if you want to, I can't say it the way the Hebrews do, but that's fine. The word means someone who has been anointed. 
It was even used in the Old Testament in reference to the pagan king Cyrus in Isaiah 45, verse 1. I have anointed Cyrus <coughs> to deliver my people. So, um, well, he got, the, he got the one part of it right, that mm -hmm. he, you are the Christ, the Son of God, mm -hmm. but he would, could have kept going and saying, you will set up your kingdom in this, in this, um, this world. You know, but he didn't go that far. But after a little while, it, it kind of showed that he was thinking that. Uh, look at a couple of verses from the Old Testament. Psalm 2, verse 2, for example. Their kings revolt, their rulers plot together against the Lord and against the king he chose. That's another a translation of anointed, okay? The one he anointed, okay? So it's the one who God chooses. Look at uh, Psalm 18, verse 50. God gives great victories to his king. He shows constant love to the one he has chosen to David and his descendants forever. So clearly, I mean, and if you, we had time to go into considerable depth, we would look at Daniel 9.25 and it talks about how the chosen one is to, be, is to die. These verses make it clear that those who are anointed have been chosen for a special task. But it is clear that Peter did not understand fully the special task for which Jesus Christ had been chosen, not at that point. The Jews had very indistinct, confused ideas about what the Messiah was supposed to do. Look at John 7, 41 and 42. Others said, he is the Messiah, but others said, the Messiah will not come from Galilee. The scripture says that the Messiah will be a descendant of King David and will be born in Bethlehem, the town where David lived. Of course, they didn't realize, I guess, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They believed he would be a descendant from David and that he would be born in the town of Bethlehem, Isaiah 11, 1 to 16, and Micah 5, 2. But they believed that he would disappear after his birth and then later reappear. Some have suggested that he would reappear riding on a white horse, leading a mighty army to help them conquer their enemies, the Romans. They certainly did not think that the Messiah would die on a cross. The Messiah was expected to kill the Romans, not to be killed by the Romans. That's wrong. They were, I mean, that's, to, uh, the, that idea to a Jew is just about as backward as you can possibly imagine, right? Well, four times in his letters, Peter's call, Peter called Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ. What's implied by those words? We've already talked about Christ, what that means. What about the Lord? What does that imply? That you follow him and do what, what he says. Mm -hmm. As he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Are we prepared to accept Jesus not only as a sacrifice for our sins, but also as the Lord of our lives? That would be the question, right? Well, this is life eternal that they, you might know uh, the Speaking of the God, Father. the only true God in, in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So, uh, and it's not just knowing about, it's a knowing uh, experientially. Yeah. Well, Second Peter 1, 1, John 1, 1, and John 28, verse 20, just are some verses which suggest that Peter, like other New Testament writers, recognized Jesus as the divine Son and as having a special relationship with the Father. We need to recognize that Jesus also called the Word in John 1, 1, was, is, and always will be fully God. Um, look at these interesting words, 2 Peter 1, verse 1. From Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have been given a faith as precious as ours. Our God and Savior Jesus Christ. What are the what's the implications of those words together like that? Well, that Jesus was God. Jesus and is God. He's both God and Savior. And you have yeah. Thomas uh, confessing the same thing after mm -hmm. Jesus appears, and he says, "My Lord and my God." And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Yeah. Those who have studied early church history understand how the early church struggled with the idea that Jesus was fully God and at the same time fully man. You know that there were 
people called docetists who believe that God really came down, but he just pretended to be a human being. And he didn't really go through all those really rough times when, when it was looking like he was uh, going to be crucified and dying. He sort of disappeared and just left the body to die there. Others said, no, Jesus was really a human being, but he was such a good human being that God sort of adopted him into his family. And so he went through those things as a human being, but he wasn't really God. So we have a hard time. I mean, let's face it, it's not easy for us to wrap our minds around the idea that someone could be fully God and fully human being at the same time. I think we have to remember that in the Septuagint already, 200 years before Christ, the word Lord was translated, I mean, the word Yahweh mm -hmm. was translated into the word Lord. Yeah. So in Greek, and I suppose they spoke more like the Greeks, in the days of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hebrew was a dead language. Yeah. Um, when they said Lord, to them it might have been clearly understood that we were talking about Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Well, remember that the Hebrews themselves felt that the, the word Yahweh was too sacred to pronounce. And so when they were, even when they were reading the Bible, as they were reading along, they came to those four letters, Y-H-W-H, we would say in, in English, they would say Adonai which is the Hebrew word for Lord. So, yeah, it was the same idea. Um, so these verses make it clear that Peter understood that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are distinct beings. Seven, and, 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 of course, the second part of that first is chapter 1 there, it talks about the Holy Spirit inspiring the prophets to write what they wrote. Seventh-day Adventists believe in the doctrine of the Trinity as one of our 28 fundamental beliefs. Um, we might have some questions about exactly how that should be worded, but theoretically that's true. Try to think back over the events, especially of that closing week of the life of Christ. Now try to remember as you review those events that he was fully God as he did all those things of that final week. Remember that Jesus, although he was God, knelt down and washed 12 pairs of dirty feet. Would your God do that? Judas's God would not. And here's some interesting words from a relatively new book called the Handbook of Seventh-day Adventist Theology. It seems logical to begin with Messiah, since I mean, if you're talking about the deity or the person of Christ or Jesus, since the Christian church owes its name to the Greek equivalent Christos, the Anointed One. The Hebrew word relates to the deliverer figure whom the Jews awaited and who would be God's agent in the inauguration of a new age for God's people. Both the Hebrew and the Greek terms are derived from roots meant meaning to anoint. Evidently, by calling him Christ, the New Testament writers regarded Jesus as specifically set aside for a particular task. So when the disciples called Jesus Messiah, or they called him Christ, Jesus Christ, what specific task do you think they had in mind? Overthrow the Romans. Overthrow the Romans, probably. Yeah. Did they go beyond that in any way? Did they ever go beyond that? Up until after the crucifixion, of course. Well, the title Christos, which is the Greek for Christ, occurs more than 500 times in the New Testament. Although there was more than one concept of messiahship among Jesus' contemporaries, and we've talked already a little bit about that, it is generally recognized that by the first century, Jews had come to look on the Messiah as someone in a special relationship with God. He would usher in the end of the age when the kingdom of God would be established. He was the one through whom God would break through into history for the deliverance of his people. Now, one of the things we need to point out, and I think we have, we can spare a minute or two here to, to point this out. The Jewish people, in fact, as far as we can tell, all the writers from the Old Testament, up until the actual death of Jesus, and until he started preaching, his ministry at least, believed that Jesus would come, or the Messiah would come once, and that would be it. There would not be a, they, they had no notion of a second coming, and not until just before John died, around 90 A.D. or somewhere around there, 
did they have did anybody have any idea of a third coming so the the people reading in Jesus day read even in Zechariah and places like that about the power of the Messiah coming and and, and conquering and how the whole world was going to flock to the to Jerusalem to worship there etc and they said well the Messiah is going to come and he's going to just solve all our problems he's going to make us the headquarters for the world and everything so their mistake was in putting all their eggs in that one basket of the first coming well Jesus recognized and accepted the term Messiah but did not encourage its use for the term carried political overtones that made its use difficult. Though reluctant to avail himself of, of it in public to describe his mission, Jesus rebuked neither Peter, we just talked about Peter's confession, nor the Samaritan woman in John 4, 25 and 26 for using it. He knew himself to be the Messiah, as seen in Mark's report of Jesus' words about giving one of his disciples a cup of water, quote, because you believe the name of Christ. Christ, again, being the Greek, Messiah being the Hebrew, Mark 9, 41. In church history, we find that church authorities have frequently tried to use the idea of an eternal life, the idea of eternal life, not only as a reward to the righteous, but as a club to try to force people to do what they wanted them to do. Now, how would you use eternal life as a club? You do this or else you won't have eternal life. Yeah, exactly. Or you're going to burn in hell. Yep, exactly. Eugene Sheldon wrote a book, Chasing Heaven to Avoid Hell. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Well, this has led some people to reject the whole idea of life after death. We live this life, we die, and that's it. There's no hell, there's no heaven, forget those things. But the Bible is very clear that God wants every one of us to be saved and to live with him forever. That's what God would like to have. Well, some atheistic critics claim that the Christian's hope is just based on pie in the sky, by and by. Is that true? No. Have you ever heard anybody talk about pie in the sky, by and by? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is living a Christian life, even today, the best way to live? I have a, a friend, or had a friend, he's passed away a number of years ago, that actually went to one of the major outside universities to get a doctorate in, in, in uh, counseling as a, as a um, psychologist, not a psychiatrist, a psychologist. And you can imagine what kind of environment that was. And he was just waiting for the day when, when someone would discover that he was a Christian. And one guy found out about it. He just started hounding him. Whatever. So one day, he, he he was walking up the stairs in the library, and this guy was coming down. And he said, "Okay, stop and wait a second. I have a few words to say to you." So the two of them were standing on the stairway, and my friend said to this other guy, he "said Let's just suppose that you're right, and that we when we die, that's it. There's nothing more. Let's say let's give you a fifty percent chance of being right." And let's say that there's a 50% 50% chance that I'm right, that I believe that after we die, there's a possibility that you're going to go to hell and I'm going to live forever with God. Why wouldn't you choose that? And the man says, well, but look at all the, look at all the things you're missing now, all the wonderful experiences you could be having right now. And it just so happens that uh, my friend had been through a rough life before he got to that point. He says... I have done all that already. I wouldn't give up that for, I wouldn't take that for anything. I'm happier in my life right now, even if there were nothing after this life than any other life. And the other guy after that never had a word to say. If there's no pie in the sky by and by. Yeah. But Paul said uh, really the same thing, except yeah. he, he prefaced it not with all. Uh, well, he could have said some of the bad stuff, but he said all the good stuff that he yeah about himself and he said uh, that uh, more than that I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing yeah. value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord and he goes on from there. Yeah. Uh, so knowing Jesus not about him but knowing him personally and receiving life his, his life even now it's, it's our bodies that are going to be re resurrection, resurrected but our life 
begins right now with the reception of the Holy Spirit. How, how does the fact that God has repeatedly prophesied about future events and those events have taken place exactly on time and the way God predicted, how does that impact your understanding of God's prophecies about the end of this earth's history? Shows us that God knows. He knows what he's doing. Yep. And he knows what's coming. Aren't you glad that the eternal hope that God has promised us in heaven can never perish, spoil, or fade? Yes. Yeah. Well, in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9 and 18 to 21, we are told about the process of salvation, of, of salvation. We see that Jesus rose from the dead and that he has promised us, us rich blessings from God. They are awaiting our eternal life in heaven. Any current sufferings which we might have to face are there to prove that our faith is genuine. But genuine faith must be tested to show that it will endure. Thus we will receive the salvation of our souls, which is the purpose of having faith. So we can be even more confident of the messages proclaimed by the prophets. Those messages could not have been thought up by some ordinary human being. God himself spoke through the Holy Spirit, inspiring those prophets. I mean, try to imagine this. How could an ordinary human being predict something that's going to happen, let's say, 500 years from now? Any one of you going to be able to do that? I mean, I mean, if you could predict what was happened, if, if you could fully predict what was going to happen tomorrow, you would be a billionaire. All you have to go to, Wall, go, to do is go to Wall Street, right? Tomorrow it's going to do this. Tomorrow it's going to do this. I'll predict something. The sun's yeah. going to come up. <laughs> yeah. You don't have any control of that. Yeah, but I know it's going to happen. Yeah. Unless something weird happens. So we can be even more confident <laughs> of the messages proclaimed by the prophets. These messages could not have been thought up by some ordinary human being. God himself spoke through the Holy Spirit, inspiring those prophets. So in summary, we can say that Peter spoke a great deal about the life, ministry, and death of Jesus. His sufferings and death are mentioned in a whole bunch of verses. I won't mention all, name them all. Notice that every chapter in this short book says something about the sufferings and the death of Jesus. There are also four clear references to his resurrection. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 21 and 3 verses 18 and 21. Peter went on to mention his ascension, 1 Peter 3, 21, and his second coming in five different places. 1 Peter 1, 5, 7, 13 and Chapter 5, verses 1 and 4. On page 107 of the teacher's edition of the Bible study guide, it says, and I quote, The life and work of Jesus permeate Peter's first epistle, but the central focus of Jesus' life and work is found in 1 Peter 3.18, <laughs> namely, the substitutionary death of Jesus for our sins and his subsequent resurrection to life in the Spirit. Well, we have suggested in this lesson that there are reasons above and beyond the substitutionary death of Jesus. And I quote, It was in order that the, and this is quoting from Mellon White, It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption that Christ bore the penalty in behalf of the human race. The throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure, even though the race be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. By the sacrifice Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled and the human race would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. Who is able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on earth? his trial in the judgment hall, his crucifixion. Who witnessed these scenes? Not us. The heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan and his angels. Signs of the times, John. So could it be true that the throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure even if the entire human race were wiped out? Well, this flies in the face of much of Christian theology, but it is core to our understanding of the great controversy. 
Our Bible study guide goes on to say, these passages teach, and this is talking about the passages in 1 Peter, teach a substitutionary atonement to pay the redemption price for our sins. Apart from the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus, there would be no provision for our salvation. This arrangement is the only way we can approach God. And there's their references. Well, we've already suggested that the death of Christ did something much more than even our salvation. But there are a number of questions raised by these comments. Is the problem that God is angry with us? Or is it that he is unloving? If a redemption price must be paid, to whom is it paid? Does Jesus pay it to the Father? Is he the one who is demanding it? Has the Father said that he will not accept us back unless the price is paid? Where are the verses for that? Or must the price be paid to the devil? The ransom theory of the atonement that some of you may have heard about uh, suggested that the Father offered his son to the devil as a ransom in exchange for all the souls of the sinners. So God makes a deal with the devil. He says, okay, you've claimed all these sinners, they're sinners, you, 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 they're yours, but I have the son. So I will give you the son if you'll give me all the sinners. And since the devil always wanted to take the place of Jesus, he happily accepted the body of Jesus only to discover after Jesus was dead and in his hands that he could not keep him in the grave. And Jesus escaped from him and returned to heaven. This would suggest that God won the great controversy by tricking the devil. Could that really be true? I know. So there's something wrong in that logic. Something wrong in that logic. A lot. God. Well, baptism, we've already mentioned, is a way a person that we join Jesus by being buried in the water and raised to resurrection at, with Jesus. Paul discusses that in Romans 6. To the Jewish people, everything depended on the coming of the Messiah as prophesied in the Old Testament. So that's why, to, when speaking to a Jewish audience, that the disciples had to talk about that. But it does not really matter to us, to me, and to you out there individually if Jesus was the Messiah, unless he also becomes Lord in our personal lives. Many, many Christians pr profess or confess these, ver these truths verbally, but they, do they live these truths? And that's the question we leave you with. Our Father, we have touched on some very, very significant issues in this lesson. We ask that those who have heard them, maybe for the first time, will think about what they've heard, will study them and digest them for themselves, and think about how that might Im impact how they would discuss this lesson. We thank you for guiding us and, and opening to us your word and these very powerful statements. May they be a blessing to all who hear them as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.